Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Cycling Cities, a webinar series organized by Interreg Europe, the policy learning platform. My name is Elena Ferrario. I am the thematic manager of the platform and together with my colleagues today, we invite you to discover uh, good practice and good initiatives related to um, network and infrastructure development for cycling. This is the second step of our series. Last week we have already met to discuss strategic planning for cycling and um, next week we are going to meet again to discuss behavioral change. Now, uh, we are expecting uh, more than 380 participants that will join us today. And while we wait for uh, the last uh, attendees to join in, a few housekeeping rules. Uh, so first of all, this webinar is recorded. Uh, in the coming days, you will be able to access the recordings of the webinar together with all the PowerPoint presentations and further reading materials on our website. And this also allows me to remind you that the recordings of the previous webinar are already available on our website. Um, you can interact and you're warmly welcome to interact with our speakers and with the organizers of this webinar using the question uh, function that is uh, that you that you can find on the right hand side of your screen. And if you face any technical difficulties, do not hesitate to reach out to Lotte, our uh, technical expert that is uh, following uh, for us this webinar on every technical uh, aspect of it. Um, now, maybe before diving in into uh, the real topic of this webinar, one word about the policy learning platform. This is a space for continuous learning where the uh, 18,000 members of our community meet, discuss, exchange their good practices and experiences on the way to better perform in their daily work when it comes to regional development policies. We offer a, a number of services uh, to our community members that I warmly encourage you to uh, discover on our website and I will spend at the end of this session one minute to maybe zoom in into one of these services that is called the peer review. And now I'm very happy to hand over the floor to uh, my colleague and the thematic expert uh, Katarina Krell, our expert for low carbon economy, who will uh, guide us throughout this webinar. Over to you Katarina. Thank you very much, uh, Elena. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome uh, to our webinar. Um, I'll be your main moderator and I'll be joined by a co-moderator, which I will introduce uh, later on. Cycling is a topic that is really in high demand in our uh, community and uh, policymakers are looking for answers to the question, how to transform my city into a cycling city in a city where the large number of people decides to take the bike to move around, be it uh, to school, to work, and also for pleasure. Um, therefore, we try to provide inspiration and solution to policymakers and mobility professionals in this series of web series. Um, my colleague Elena has already uh, mentioned it. So this is the second uh, uh, series. Last week's uh, focus was on cycling strategy and how cycling deserves its own dedicated strategy, which should, however, be linked to the overall uh, sum, to the mobility strategy. And uh, you can find uh, the link to the recordings uh, also in the um, in the in the in the chat, my colleague has pasted it there for you. Today we're looking at infrastructure, and uh, next week uh, we look at behavior change and how to get more people to cycle. Um, so, but now I would like to ask you: Are you happy with the cycling infrastructure in your city? And uh, uh, give us a quick uh, idea of uh, what you're thinking. Yes there is room for improvement or it is quite poor at present. Uh, the, the poll is anonymous, so uh, you can be as harsh as uh, you think you have to be. Okay, I live in Brussels, but my hometown is Freiburg in Germany. And I can say that Brussels still has a long way to go in terms of the safe and attractive uh, uh, cycling infrastructure. Mm, let's see the results. Oh, okay. 
you are in the right webinar, I would say. Only 7% are happy with the infrastructure for cycling in their city and uh, join me in the assessment that there is room for improvement or it's, it's, it's even bad. Um, all right. Now, I am a fearless biker and I bike since I'm small, so I bike just the same, even if the infrastructure is poor. But uh, poor infrastructure can be a very strong reason why many people are not cycling, uh, as you should be able to see from the responses to a survey to The Guardian, which um, should be uh, visible on the screen, but is not. Actually, it's a, it's a survey from The Guardian, which uh, shows uh, the reasons why people are not cycling. And uh, among the top 10 reasons uh, is substandard infrastructure, the perception of danger, the lack of facilities, and the state of the roads are coming up as reasons for not cycling. And all these points relate to infrastructure. So uh, this is uh, where you can see it on the slides. So we see the many poor points that relate to infrastructure. And this is why we have designed our agenda today around this very important uh, uh, topic. And uh, so it is time to introduce uh, our agenda. And uh, we have uh, the pleasure to have Meredith Glazer for a keynote on quality criteria for the design of cycling uh, infrastructure. This introductory keynote will be followed by three good practices. One is coming to us uh, from Tartu, brought by Indrek Raniku on uh, Tartu's network planning and uh, construction of cycling roads. Rose Power from Ireland uh, will bring us uh, information about how to link cycling um, to the other uh, modes of transport into a cycle and ride infrastructure associated uh, to uh, the public uh, uh, light rail. And uh, Isabel Garnica from uh, Vitoria Gasteiz is going to bring us some examples from Spain where uh, an, an infrastructure of safe uh, bike parkings have been uh, implemented. So this uh, will then be followed by time for taking the questions from the audience that you can please uh, submit to us uh, uh, through the chat function. And uh, um, then we will wrap up. And um, so without uh, uh, further ado, I would like uh, to hand over to uh, Meredith. Please uh, turn on your camera and uh, your mic and start sharing your screen while I introduce you. So Meredith is a researcher at the Urban Cycling Institute at the University of Amsterdam. She's also a PhD candidate. And she's been involved in Dutch cycling policy for nearly 10 years already. And I should mention that she's the knowledge manager of the Interreg Europe uh, uh, project Cyclewalk and also involved in the Civitas uh, uh, Handshake project. So Meredith, uh, over to you, please. Great, thank you. Can I just get a confirmation that you can see my screen? Yes. All good. Great. Um, Okay, good. Yeah, hello everyone. I um, haven't get, gotten a chance to see it, all the attendees, but I already saw a few familiar names. Uh, so welcome everyone. I'm, I'm really happy to be here and to share with you one of our great um, products that we developed through the CycleWalk uh, Interreg program um, with six regional partners from, um, from all over Europe. But, but first, um, But first, I would like to have a kind reminder of the gravity of the context that we are facing. Um, and we seem to be in the midst of a multifaceted transportation revolution where cities are increasingly and regions are increasingly recognizing the negative consequences of car dependency. Um, arguably, one of the largest is deaths and injuries from car use. On European roads, uh, about 63 people are killed every day because of car use. And at the same time, we have venture capitalists pouring billions into mobility technologies that are trying to lure users to new services and devices. Um, but these aren't really offering solutions. Rather, they are further straining municipal resources, their capacity, and they are very good at distracting political leadership. And on top of this, we are, of course, in the midst of a global pandemic that has devastated public health. 
Um, but although there is a silver lining that many cities um, and their city leaders or regional leaders are questioning the use and the character of their now empty streets. So there is sort of this momentum taking place. The bad news is that things um, are getting worse, according to statistics and research, that car use is generally not changing, that air quality continues to decline, that public health continues to denigrate, and especially underrepresented groups and people of color, those in poverty, are disproportionately affected. And even as progressive and visionary as many European cities are, the pre-pandemic statistics do not show much improvement. And one reason for this is that cities and regions are really struggling to make any change to their streets and their street networks. And even in cities with the political commitment and even in cities that have adopted policies that support this vision of multimodal transportation and active transportation, the on the ground implementation faces a whole new battleground. So alternatives to driving just aren't gaining traction quick enough, specifically around cycling. And if our Bergenland Austria partners are here, um, you will recognize this, this street that we visited um, that, that is shown on the, on the screen right now. So the advantages of cycling are well known and every day new research on cycling continues to demonstrate the benefits, not only for public health, of course, with physical activity, which is direly needed in this era of ever increasing rates of obesity and chronic disease, but um, also a lot of environmental benefits, the space, energy efficiency, um, and cycling might promote social cohesion and connection among people which can be even more important in, in a time like we are going through today. Um, there is also good reason to believe from research that cycling can improve the economy. For every one kilometer driven, we lose 16 cents. And for every one kilometer cycled, we gain 16, 16 cents. So I'm sorry, 23 cents. Um, so how do we create a transport system that protects the most vulnerable while also achieving these other urban visions and goals like efficiency of transport systems, mobility, accessibility, actually reaching the destinations that are essential and meaningful, um, all the way to urban logistics and, and public health, um, other social goals of, of just joy and cohesion. Um, how can our cities alter their streets to promote this very contested mode of bicycling? And so today in this uh, webinar, we're specifically exploring the role of street space, which is often called bicycle infrastructure. Uh, and it just so happens, not coincidentally, that investing and designing and building bicycle infrastructure are practices that the Dutch in the Netherlands have been refining for the past 40 years or so. And at, Urban, at the Urban Cycling Institute at the University of Amsterdam, part of our mission is to bring some of that knowledge and the, the research and science behind it to that realm of practice. So cycling has reached very high levels in many Dutch cities. I probably don't need to review this, but it is interesting to see that uh, some of the differences in uh, between neighborhoods, even within a city. So what you see on the screen is uh, is a map of, of the different um, neighborhoods of Amsterdam. And this we're, we are talking on a city level, not on the regional level. Um, and you see a lot of different, uh, people are taking a lot of different modes in the different areas. There's car, there's bike and public transit. And these numbers are, are very different per neighborhood. So on-street infrastructure has played a key role, uh, and that's what we're talking about today, but it's also not the only factor. There are a lot of other factors going on here. Um, but what are some of those infrastructure tactics? 
So in CycleWalk, our consortium of six regional partners, we worked together to develop a set of quality criteria to increase cycling levels. And the quality criteria tool was designed to be used by any region. And it's aiming to capture a very holistic framework of what a region would need to increase cycling levels. So infrastructure is only one of the criteria. And today I'll present some of the factors that we identified as the most important for the infrastructure criterion. But um, there are a lot of other ones that are also very important. And you can check out the entire document. They're either now or later on will be sent around a link to, uh, to that tool that we created. So I will go over these three uh, criteria that we identified. The first one are design principles. And any Dutch transport planner would start their pitch with the sustainable or systematic safety element. Um, these are a set of policies that were in effect in the 90s. And the principles of sustainable safety are that humans are vulnerable. We can easily be hurt, we can easily be injured, and as part of human nature, we make mistakes, we make errors. So because of this, uh, the government is responsible for keeping public space, including the streets, safe for us and for all. And the government should do everything it can to prevent crashes and to reduce the consequences of those crashes. And the design of public space, therefore, should reflect these principles. Essentially, design can keep people safe. So keeping people safe on the roads means also keeping speeds of cars very low. And it also means organizing the urban road space so that it's predictable and that different users can intuitively know what's expected of them. This is one of my favorite examples. So um, I'm hoping you can see my mouse, but we would be driving, if in a car, we would be driving, you know, um, uh, and, and turning on to this street. And what you would see, what you would experience as a car driver is, this what I call a welcome mat. And you, you're, you would elevate onto that welcome mat, which is essentially an extended sidewalk area, um, complete with the separated bike path. And then you would traverse over it and onto then the residential street. So coming from this arterial, which by the way is a 30 kilometer arterial, but it has pretty high traffic volumes. Um, and, they, and, they, and people can speed too. Um, so if you turn off the arterial and onto this residential street, this welcome mat is here. And the welcome mat tells the driver, hey, slow down, pay attention. This is an area that people will be walking, kids might be walking, people will be riding a bicycle. And besides this very small, well, normal size 30 kilometer zone, um, sign, notice that there aren't any other large signs or markings. It's all in the design. So essentially what this example and this next example is showing is that cycling infrastructure is also car infrastructure, which is also pedestrian infrastructure. They are holistically integrated. Um, and in this example, this is a street in the lovely uh, canal district of Amsterdam. It's very residential, as you can see, but it's also a lot of mixed uses. There's grocery stores, um, there's daycares, doctor's offices, et cetera. And so bicycle infrastructure isn't needed here, but rather there is very strict traffic calming measures. Uh, and these were some of the measures that I was explaining that took place in, um, in the 90s. So using very slow speeds, uh, one-way roads, and, um, and you can see that this is a 30-kilometer zone. It's a one-way. Uh, there are lots of human-scale materials and landscaping that signals to drivers that this is a place where there will be a lot of people around and that uh, to expect to drive very slowly. 
Um, and this is an example from one of our colleagues, Mark Wachemur, who runs the Bicycle Dutch website, which is extraordinarily useful for examples like this. And he is a infrastructure design expert. Um, so on arterials where car drivers are going faster speeds and there's you know a lot larger volumes the separated bike paths protect cyclists and that's what you can see here is a separated bike path so in addition to um these elements such as the yield markings that you that i've circled here um, we call them shark's teeth um, but also landscaping um, bulb outs lighting uh, paving materials. These are all very human, human design elements that signal to all users that you know you need to pay attention. But it also provides um, provides human comfort, right? That this bicyclist it has a smooth surface to ride on, and it adds a sense of comfort and subjective safety. So since these policies, which by the way were very risky at this time, this was not something that was just, you know, let's do it. Yeah, sure, easy enough. This was a very risky, um, content, contested uh, set of policies that were passed in the early 90s. But after that, Amsterdam and many other cities here saw immediate results in less than a decade. And what you're seeing now is, is a graph, hopefully what you're seeing, is a graph of uh, the mode split over time since 1990 up until 2010. Um, and it still has increased uh, again, it's differed by certain by neighborhoods, of course, but this is a general picture that you see car use decreasing uh, and uh, and bike use increasing. And so the city continues to reap benefits from this, not only in the higher mode share, also in very, very low rates of traffic deaths and injuries. Number two, oh gosh, I'm over time. Yes. Um, is, a, is a complete network. Um, I get too excited about this topic. But if you see here that the car network is a hierarchy system, uh, and this is where the bike network will be overlaid with it. So um, in addition to the protected bike infrastructure, you see here the bike network um, also takes advantage of these green spaces and slow speed streets and creating these overlapping and complementary networks. That was a quick one. This one is also very quick, but it is an integration to public transit. Um, and to optimize the sustainable transport potential, it is vital to leverage these synergies between public transit and cycling and also walking. And this is where we can possibly replace car trips. Because if you see here on the screen is, uh, is a model of what a traditional transit-oriented development would be like, where you have the blue dot as the station, the first blue ring uh, as the uh, immediate surroundings, and then the walking distance from to that station. But a bike train system is completely different. You see this overlapping effect of catchment areas because people on bikes are much more willing to bike longer distances than people walking. So um, that's what we see here in Amsterdam too in the Netherlands. Depending on where I am, I can choose which station I want to go to. And depending on that station's attributes like um, the qualities of it, or the stores nearby, or if I need to link with another, um, with, an, with other errands, I can choose that station. And of course, we need to have these facilities at, at public transit stations that um, will accommodate the bicycle. So essentially, we've got these three. We need design, we have safe, comfortable routes. We need a continuous network to get people where they need to go. And we need to integrate public transit, which can leverage the synergies and replace car trips. And of course, there are other crucial policy areas that we address in, uh, in our quality criteria. So that was, and, and we also have, if you want to learn more, the massive online open courses on Coursera. Um, and our website. I'm sorry I went four minutes over, but this is, uh, this is a tough topic to, to, to give in 12 minutes. So there you go. Thank you. Yes, I know it's challenging, but uh, you're a professional, so. <laughs> and I did time myself, but um, you know, 
I, I go off script and then that's what happens. And I'm that's what so I mean, it was interesting. No Thank problem. you very much, Meredith. Um, we skip the poll and uh, take a question uh, instead. Uh, one of our participants would like to know if the red uh, uh, um, concrete asphalt uh, is more expensive than the gray one. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Yeah, it is. But however, they do uh, work a little bit with that. So it's only the top three centimeters that is actually the, the dyed red asphalt. Um, so it's not very deep and in, in, and into the into the pavement, um, but that means it does need to be you know maintained in a certain way and um, and repaved you know more often than than gray pavement. But yeah, that's a really good question. And a lot of cities are working with how do we uh, how do we create a part of that you know that visual identity for um, for a network? Um, cities are using green. They're, they are using red, they're, use, they're trying out a, a lot of different colors, uh, and it all depends on your own city's code. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry. Yes, we have uh, uh, a lot of questions, but um, I would like uh, uh, to take them in the, at the end uh, to give the other presenters also the chance uh, uh, to make their uh, contributions and then uh, uh, read the questions uh, together in the end. So uh, uh, please bear with us. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Meredith. I think uh, you outlined very uh, well how a good design should look like. Uh, and this goes together with the Commission's pledge, uh, uh, invitation to the cities to pledge for expanding the cycling infrastructures and to build an extra 5,000 kilometers of safe bike lanes. So this is what is expected from the cities. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see uh, then how this has been implemented, uh, for instance, uh, in Tartu. And I invite uh, Indrik uh, uh, Raniko from the Tartu City Department of Urban Planning and Land Management uh, to turn on their camera. Meredith, uh, you may turn off. Um, Indrik, um, please take the floor, share your screen and uh, explain us uh, how you have uh, dealt with the holes in the network and in the unsafe uh, uh, crossings, uh, uh, etc. Okay. Over to you and please try to keep your time. Me. Hello, everybody. Do you see my presentation very well or not? Well, we see it like uh, a venue tried. We see uh, still the control panel and um, we don't see the, the full screen mode. Do you remember? Yes, this is one thing. And then you go on the top. Not this, but the one to the left. Further to the left with your mouse, there is there. The I cannot read it, but you have to click on the two centimeters on the left from there. You did it before. Okay. Stop sharing. Lotte, can you help? Because I can't see what is written there. I cannot guide him properly. I have webcams. Hi, Indrek. On the, the top of your screen in the middle, you should see an option of display settings. On the top of the PowerPoint presentation show. No, uh, on the other side, so towards the left. Yes. On the top. Oh, you know, never mind. Just uh, run it like this. Um, we can see it well enough. Yeah. Just a little smaller. Just go ahead. In fact, right, please start your presentation. Never mind, we can see. It's a bit smaller, but uh, we can st still see. Yeah. Mainly okay, so uh, I'm from Tartu, it's Estonia, second city, and at first uh, 
some words about city uh, because it's important to understand uh, in the cycling point of view also. Uh, population is 100,000, it means that it's middle city, smaller middle city, very concentrated city, very dense city. We have uh, universities, big universities, two big universities, and uh, it means that 24,000 students. It's mainly student city. Uh, main uh, stu university, Starter University, and uh, inside the university, of also medical center, clinic. And that second uh, Estonia, Tartu is a cultural center, like a second city in Estonia. Uh, and uh, regional center, of course, also. Uh, and uh, in cityscape, it's important to explain that uh, uh, most uh, most cyclic uh, users are the students, uh, and uh, we have uh, uh, old city campus. Um, what is a mix of these uh, old historical houses in, uh, in city center, old, uh, mid, uh, old city center. Here we have uh, Humanitaria and Socialia, uh, university institutes, and we have new campus uh, uh, um, on the border of city, it's a mostly technical science, scientist and uh, biomedical scientist. We have railway, old railway, it's uh, quite wide, uh, and uh, our quite big program connection between campuses and uh, the connection with, through the through the railway, and also. We have residential areas as usual and uh, some uh, small industrial areas and the old um, uh, Soviet military areas is here. Now it's very quickly developed uh, as a residential and uh, as, a, as a new city uh, scape, uh, uh, beautiful scape. Okay. What we have in, in, uh, in cycling, cycling point of life, uh, we have very fresh cycling strategy approved by city council. It was a quite long way. We have new master plan draft, but this includes uh, cycling part. We have climate action plan. It's also important for cycling to supporting of cycling ideology. We have cyc uh, the uh, cycling uh, sharing system working two years, electrical uh, cyclist, etc., etc., and it's, it's, it's uh, very, very popular. Uh, for, for us, it uh, was a big, uh, big, um, big chance. It, uh, and, uh, and in cityscape, uh, in, in, in streets, we two years uh, saw, see, and saw very big change. Thanks for uh, car rental system. Uh, car or bike landing is fresh, it's only start. Many cycling enthusiasts, of course, like in every city, in every country, and uh, political support. Uh, um, not uh, we don't need the everyday support, but uh, but in a strategic level, we we feel very strong support. Uh, support. Okay. Andre, I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry, but you need to speed up a little bit. You have four minutes left, please. Thank you. Okay. Oh, well, quite sad model split. You can see the current situation where the uh, cyclists only 8% uh, and the car drivers 
46 protons, and you can see our main idea to pick up the cyclist number 26 and uh, low, slow, low down uh, car drivers uh, 24 protons. It's a big dream, of course. But anyway, here is the main points of uh, strategy, as you see. It's important this this uh, place where we try to rise cyclist number per one process per year and uh, reduce uh, uh, car drive, uh, drivers using of cars one process per year. So here you can see illustration where we it's an important point is here. Uh, car drivers uh, reduced to uh, 26 percent and uh, cyclists percent must be picked up uh, to 26 percent. Uh, here is the main uh, slides about the uh, strategy. Now I talk a little bit about master planning process. We have several investigations. This is a one I think it's a quite typical example. Here is a uh, other investigation, and uh, here is a also one is investigation with uh, with picture where the university new house in old city center, new bridge and river. It's working very well. And uh, inside the uh, in, uh, master planning process, uh, we made an uh, item collection through the home page, and we have had uh, more than a thousand of uh, answers about new roads, where, where we must be new roads, where is the problems, points, bad condition of streets or um, crazy uh, crossings uh, or something. Everybody uh, have possibilities to click and uh, to write something about uh, problems. It is working very well. And now we have uh, good data, uh, good op uh, data of opinions, uh, citizens uh, who use bicycles. And we select uh, through this uh, idea caching, we select uh, mm, uh, 12 uh, main uh, problematic. Uh, uh, cross, crossings and uh, problematic points, uh, what we used uh, to um, uh, think about uh, new master plan rules. Here you can see our new master plan. Here is a the black is a main cycling streets and the blue one is a supporting street uh, supporting uh, streets and special plan we made for city center here is the only pedestrian streets reducing car street uh, car uh, streets without parking etc etc so i think that's also a quite typical uh, uh, case here you can see 12 uh, crossings and uh, we fixed it and uh, made uh, for every crossing uh, this uh, uh, in a project level that's kind of drawings. Here you can see bad examples, There's some bad and good examples. Uh, here is a one uh, crossing in the main street, quite important street and uh, and now we have good idea to renovate it and change meaning and, uh, and uh, street, uh, uh, street functions. Here you can see old uh, railway station and especially the escape uh, 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 before the railway station. It was uh, two years working like only for, for only cars. Now we we uh, um, changed totally this scape and uh, and we have quite big area for um, pedestrian and cyclists and uh, um, car 
parts must be moved a little bit out. Here is a photo about this. Also, we have uh, uh, many ideas uh, the crossing of a uh, river. This is uh, uh, going on the middle of a uh, city, quite beautiful, like uh, everywhere, the rivers. Uh, but uh, we haven't enough uh, bridges for uh, uh, walkers and, and uh, cyclists. And now we try to change totally this, uh, this uh, uh, history. And here you can see the most, now it is the most important uh, structure in, in cycling uh, in the world in Tartu. This is a, a connection through the a channel connection through the railway and we try to um, connect the new campus and historical city campus uh, through the railway uh, uh, through the railway this is a beautiful picture and this is uh, uh, all this under construction now this is a picture five years five hours ago and then this is uh, one beautiful picture near the river. And also important to understand that to is a cultural city after a couple of years. This is a Rathaus and uh, main main historical plots. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Indrek. Um, I think. Tartu can be quite uh, proud. You have already many elements. You have a vision, you have a cycling strategy, you have quantified targets for 2040, ambitious ones. And uh, it was nice to see how the cycling network uh, was improved, how the importance was put on the coherence and how you also had to build uh, around and across obstacles, rivers, railway crossings, and, and that you put uh, in place much safer uh, uh, solutions for the dangerous crossings. So uh, there was uh, certainly of uh, uh, added value for the audience uh, to see that. Meredith, uh, do we have uh, any specific question to Indrek? Yeah, sure. Hi, thank you, Indrek. That was really great. Um, you know, one thing, one question that came to mind was uh, was about land use. You had that great graph of the different uh, uses at the beginning of the presentation. Could you maybe touch on how um, how to prioritize these different land uses, uh, and maybe maybe even on more of a fine grain scale? You know, as thinking of essential services and um, main employers and the campus, for example, or if there's different campus locations. How does the, the integration of the bicycle network um, uh, yeah, flow between these, uh, these different land uses? Um, uh, the uh, Tartu situation is uh, 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 the weak uh, transport uh, situation in Tartu like uh, it's uh, similar like in every student city uh, we have uh, we haven't uh, lines uh, typical lines uh, the morning vehicles to go to city center and, and uh, the evening vehicles uh, go out to the city centers somewhere uh, we have uh, during the day we have very mixed uh, um, distance very mixed uh, uh, places uh, where people going. It's it means that uh, to build up a uh, uh, street uh, and especially a uh, bicycle network is a quite uh, quite uh, hard uh, um, uh, uh, challenge uh, to to find uh, the best way to connect something. It is not easy. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, Marco, do we have a direct question to Indrek? Yes, Katarina. Uh, we have, for example, Giovanni Varju from Sardinia, who's asking if the streets that are currently also used for cars are safe uh, as well uh, for cyclists. In Tartu, of course. 
Actually, I understand clearly questions. Actually, I uh, talk, talk, talk mainly about master plan level and strategic level. level. It's uh, easy to talk, but when we start to talk about uh, street design, we have uh, discussed them more than five years. What part of uh, the people of city government uh, think that uh, it would be good if the cyclist roads going with car roads and one part said that cycling roads uh, must be included to the with pedestrian roads. Mm. And this discussion not finished yet. Mm -hmm. It means that uh, I haven't answered. Well, another uh, participant uh, says reinforcing a 30 kilometer uh, speed limit uh, uh, will make the, the streets that are shared between cars and bicycles much safer for the bicycles. And uh, so, yeah, indeed. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Indrek, for the interesting contribution. And uh, I would like uh, to call uh, uh, Rose Power to uh, uh, the scene. Rose is an EU projects officer with the Southern uh, Regional Assembly, which is a managing authority in Ireland. And uh, uh, Rose, uh, over to you, please. Okay. Can I check that you can see my screen? Yeah. All good. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, for those of you who have not met me before, my name is Rose Power. I'm an EU project officer with the Southern Regional Assembly and also a partner in the Interreg Europe Macho project. And today I'd like to take you through one of the good practices that we identified as part of the Macho project, which is cycle and ride infrastructure associated with the Lewis Life Rail. So, why do we need to improve cycle and ride infrastructure, particularly in Dublin, which is where our Lewis Light Rail is? Well, a recent environmental report basically advised us that Dublin was in danger of exceeding EU emission limits. In addition to that, the population of Dublin is due to increase by over 30% by 2036. And historically, Dublin is also predominantly a low rise city, which has created a lot of urban sprawl and this has increased substantially the numbers of daily commuters. And finally, most recently in 2018, a survey was undertaken and they assessed Dublin ahead of Paris, London and Milan, who are by far much bigger cities, but the average time spent by commuters in Dublin city was far higher than in those cities. So this was one of the big reasons why we needed to improve the cycle and ride infrastructure in the city. So you'll see from the visual here, uh, this is just a depiction to show you the kind of space that the different modes of transport take up in our roads and in our systems. And you can see by far a light rail or tram takes up significantly less road space and therefore will have a dramatic impact on the level of conge congestion and also on air and noise pollution. So the only problem with that is, unfortunately, our trams don't stop outside our houses and they don't bring us directly to our places of work or education. So we need to also be thinking about when we're looking at infrastructure, uh, we need to be thinking about how are we going to get people to the tram station or light rail station? How are we going to make it possible for them to walk, on, walk or cycle the first part of their journey and the final part of their journey? And that brings me to what we did with our good practice cycle and ride infrastructure associated with the Lewis Light Rail. This practice is obviously based in Dublin City and the Lewis Light Rail is a 43 kilometre in length light railway system. It has 67 stations and the basic ethos of the Lewis Light Rail is to listen to passenger needs and then develop the relevant infrastructure that's required to deliver on those needs and thereby increase the level of cycling. So in order to encourage cyclists to uh, use the cycle and ride facilities, 
there was a comprehensive review undertaken to um, review the accessibility um, at each stop along the route. And also they undertook a passenger survey to identify why people or what would people need to be encouraged to actually use cycle and ride with the Lewis Light Rail. And three major findings were identified. One were problems with access, problems with safety, and problems with convenience. And I'll give, go through those in detail in the coming slides. So the first thing they did was, sorry, highlighter is not working. Uh, there we go. The first thing they did was they went out and they had a look at what was happening on the ground around these stations. And you can see there in the highlighter, the actual informal routes that were developed by people to actually get them to the stations, including going over actual barriers. Um, so first of all, they knew that obviously direct routes and direct access to the stations in certain locations needed to be improved. In order to actually undertake this work, because the Lewis Light Rail is operated by Transport Infrastructure Ireland, they had to have extensive stakeholder engagement because they needed everyone to come on board, multiple government departments, local authorities, rail and road providers, citizens. So an extensive stakeholder engagement process was undertaken in order to take into account everyone's requirements and needs and also to bring everyone to the table to deliver this comprehensive change to improve the cycle and ride infrastructure. So as a result of that, direct access they looked at, and I've given you a couple of examples here, and you can see here, the station is currently here uh, in, in this area in Dublin, but if you're living here, you've got to make this route to get there. So what they're looking at is, well, what's the best way to get, if you're living here, rather than making this kind of a, a route, if they provided access here, they would significantly reduce the journey times and encourage people maybe to walk or cycle to the station. Same example here, this, is the this was the current route for someone to get there, whereas if they provide an access quickly here, they can have a dramatic impact on the numbers of people that would actually access it. One of the major areas that people voiced a concern about was in relation to safety. So CCTV cameras were installed at all stations and in all trams. Uh, in addition to that, they reviewed all the stations and improved lightings, particularly where you had um, a lot of uh, trees or coverage um, and there were dark access levels. Uh, the per passenger survey also indicated that passengers wanted to feel safe and wanted to, make, wanted to feel that their belongings and their bikes were safe. So if they were going to park to the drive, uh, they're going to cycle to the station. They wanted to make sure that there was parking facilities or storage lockers that were there, particularly in this day and age where people may be purchasing very expensive bikes. They wanted to make sure that they could park them um, and they would feel that these were safe. So in order to ensure that that was the case, um, the Lewis Light Rail looked at the quality of the design and the kind of materials that they were going to use to provide the necessary bike parking and storage. And they use that branding then across the network to give that sense of safety um, to, to the passengers. So below you can see some pictures of some of the quality bike parking and lockers uh, inside in Dundrum. These are the actual lockers, a bit of a close up of them there. Uh, and as you'll see, uh, in addition to that, the par bike parking all had covered covered areas. The Irish weather, unfortunately, doesn't lend itself to, to being dry. So in order to make sure that cyclists didn't come back to the last leg of their journey and have to sit onto bikes with, um, with uh, wet saddles, um, it's important for us to have a covered bar bike parking here. In addition to that, they also took a look at the final part of the journey. So once you get onto the train and you get to your destination, you're not necessarily at your place of work or your place of education. So what they looked at was in the three largest stations that they installed a uh, bike hire facilities so that you could continue on your journey if it was further than walking distance with the use of hire bikes. This is an example then of Houston Station in Dublin, and you can see here whereby all of the modes of transport are interlinked with one another. You can see where you have your bicycle hire and parking, your bus stops, your tram stop, and the train station. And that train station uh, links up regionally and nationally to all the other major cities in Ireland. And all of these modes of transport 
uh, are all literally within 10 metres of the train station. And this is directly as a result of the cycle and ride infrastructure that was put in place. Now, however, it's not all plain sailing. There were some difficulties experienced in putting this good practice in place. Um, one of the main difficulties was limited space around some of the stations. You're going back here and you're trying to retrofit these areas. Um, it requires widening footpaths. It requires gaining space from other places like the road in order to make sure that you have the necessary bike parking and storage lockers in these areas. Um, in addition to that, because they went for a much higher spec of design and material, this led to higher costs. So it took a little bit more convincing to stakeholders to convince them that this was the right way to go in order to alleviate the safety concerns of the passengers. Um, another area that they had difficulties was in the bike storage lockers. Initially, they were trying to manage them themselves, but this has improved because now there's third parties in the market who are actually willing and able and much better at managing the third party rental provision. Uh, and finally then, apart from the costs of doing all of that, they then needed a budget in order to undertake information campaigns. There is no point in putting the infrastructure in place unless people are fully aware that it's there and that all their safety concerns have been addressed in order to encourage the use of it. Um, however, all those problems aside, the results of this good practice were very impressive. There is 340 new bike parking places were installed, bike lockers were installed at 20 stations and bike hire facilities at three stations. There's improved lighting at all of our stations and CCTV. Um, and in addition to that, they improved cycle paths and provided direct access routes. And all of this encouraged uh, people to walk and cycle to the tram station in far greater numbers than had historically been there. And you'll see here as well on this slide, the Lewis Light Rail continues to seek and continually seeks passenger feedback. Um, they're always looking to improve the infrastructure around cycle and ride and on their website, which this is an extract at the end here, uh, on their web website, they're asking, you know, to send on information, to send on photographs, to send on comments about anything else that they can continue to improve. And this is their way of actually um, listening to their customers and passengers' needs on an ongoing basis. So the impact of this good practice here in Ireland is that passenger journeys on the loose increased by 41% in three years. And the number of daily cyclists in Dublin has doubled since 2011. That's probably increased dramatically now with COVID-19, but unfortunately I don't have figures for that. But they are incorporating the learning and infrastructure requirements identified by this good practice uh, into the planning stage of extensions to these tram lines. So they're taking the learnings and when they're doing the planning for extensions, they're taking account of all of the requirements they need for cycle and ride in order to actually improve the tram line before it's even built. Um, finally, outside of Ireland, uh, there's currently no tram services. Okay, so we did take the learnings from this good practice along with learnings that we got from the inter-regional partners in the Macho project. And this in inspired us to develop a framework and methodology for a 10 minute town concept, whereby people could walk or cycle within a 10 minute time limit to access all essential services in all key towns in Southern Ireland. So here is a look at the uh, 10 minute town framework. We developed this by um, doing a pilot on three key towns in Ireland, Ennis, Carlo and Tralee. And basically this methodology now has been provided to all of our local authorities in Southern Ireland. And these local authorities will use, utilize this framework uh, to incor incorporate a 10 minute town concept into their local transport and development plans going forward. Uh, now I don't have time today to go through that in detail, but I believe a link to that document is in the handouts for you to take a look at. Um, but it is given us the opportunity to take some learnings from what was a good practice in, for our Lewis Light Rail and to still incorporate those aspects by listening and talking to passengers and the public and putting into place 
the necessary framework and infrastructure that's required to encourage further walking and cycling in all of our key towns. So I'm hoping I stayed within the time limit there. Thank you very much for listening and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you very much, for Rose. Uh, um, excellent presentation, uh, almost perfect uh, timing as usual. So um, I think uh, you started with a very interesting uh, statement that actually business as usual is impossible. Otherwise, Dublin would choke within the next uh, two decades. So Absolutely. that means cycling and the development of public transport is not just uh, uh, let's say a nice to have, but it's actually essential as a solution. Uh, so this is interesting uh, to retain. And then um, very happy that you uh, uh, introduced the first and the last mile challenge and uh, how cycling uh, can uh, and, and, and better walking paths as well uh, can help uh, close this gap. And um, I was really, really impressed with the good practices, um, openness uh, to take on uh, feedback from the from the users and the surveys taken at every stop and so on. So I, I think this is something uh, uh, to really, really put forward uh, and recommend to other policymakers. I wanted to ask you, what is the role of uh, the managing authority that you represent uh, in this? Well, the managing authority in Ireland uh, we're uh, one of three regional assemblies and we're the link from the local authorities and the national government. And basically we ensure that all the local development plans comply with the regional spatial and economic strategy. And basically that ensures that funding and investment is then provided to the local authorities to enhance their infrastructure for cycling, walking and cycle paths. Now, in this particular case for the Lewis Light Rail, this uh, infrastructure was provided by Transport Infrastructure Ireland, which is a national organisation, and the funding came from the National Transport Authority, which is mainly exchequer funding, so it's not co-funded. But what I can tell you is uh, we do have some funding that we co-fund under the RDF programmes as managing authority. It's not just this particular one, but I do know from talking to our colleagues that following an assessment of each of the stops, there was an undertaking, as I said, an accessibility review and a passenger survey. So you can imagine those different requirements for each stop along the route. But on average, to put in the, the to look at the, the typical costs of bike parking, storage, the paving, the landscaping, the lighting and the CCTV, it was costing on average about 109,000 per stop. OK, so that's not an unreasonable amount. So it's not insurmountable for other regions when they're looking at their light rail to look at this kind of a good practice, because if it can have that dramatic an impact for that reasonable cost, it's, you know, now I know you'll have multiple stops along the route, but it's not, uh, it's not out there. We're not talking about, you know, um, uh, excessive amounts of funding for what can have an immediate impact on the numbers of people cycling and walking to your light rail services. Mm, it's true, uh, your increase uh, in users was really impressive. It's not just a few percentage uh, points. Yeah. Let's see if we have a direct question uh, to Rose from the audience, Marco. Yes, we have some questions for Rose for sure. So people are interested in uh, discovering if you're planning to allow cyclists aboard of trains also, especially uh, in uh, off-peak hours. And also if you're uh, planning to expand uh, your network of protected bicycle parking spaces. Planning to expand our network? Of protected bicycle uh, parking spaces. Oh yeah. Okay, well, first of all, um, I don't represent the public transport companies. But I can tell you at the moment, there's currently no current plans to allow people to travel with their bicycles. And I know that's a big frustration for cyclists uh, across Europe. Um, there's very good reasons for it at the moment in that we don't have the necessary carriages that would allow the safe travel of it. We also have huge congestion on our public transport. And if we were to allow bicycles on, the numbers that could travel by public transport would be significantly decreased. I'm not saying that that's not an area we can't look at, but I think we probably have to look at smarter ways of doing that transportation. And we're not quite there at the moment. In relation to the bicycle parking and safe bike bicycle parking, uh, yes, across the whole of Ireland, 
we have substantial funds set aside going forward in relation to funding that we will make available approximately 10% of Ireland's transport budget and a significant amount of that will be to improve the safety of, uh, of cycling and also in continuing to provide safe biking, bike parking facilities um, at all of our major amenities and all of our public transport. This is a good uh, cue to lead over to our next uh, presenter, which is focusing essentially on safe uh, parking facilities for bikes. Uh, uh, thank you, Rose. And uh, I would like to call uh, Isabel Garnica to uh, uh, switch on her webcam and uh, her microphone and start sharing her presentation. Uh, Isabel is, uh, is working at the um, is an environmental officer and EU project manager um, at the Environmental Studies Center that belongs to the Vitoria Gasteiz uh, City Council. Isabel, over to you. Um, thank you, Katarina, and good afternoon, everybody. I will start presenting uh, Vitoria Gasteiz. Uh, which is a medium-sized city of approximately 250,000 inhabitants, most of them working within the city limits. Uh, it's a compact and flat city and it has a cycling network of 160 kilometers. Uh, distances are short, as you can see in the image. Uh, there are just three kilometers from the city center to the green belt that uh, surrounds the city. Only the new expansions to the east and to the west uh, exceed that distance, but not by far. These positive features have contributed to the increase of the bicycle modal share from 3% in 2006 to 8% in 2019. At this moment, the number of bicycles is approximately 160,000 for a population of 250,000, as I mentioned before. This implies more bikes left on the streets and the citizens' demand for more parking spaces. I will add that although there is not a major problem of uh, bicycle theft, it is a fact when asked what are the possible reasons for not using a bike, one of the answers is the risk of theft. Uh, we are exploring different approaches to tackle with this issue. Traditionally, the, major, the majority of parking spaces were created by the municipality on the street uh, for free as bicycle parks. New residential blocks from the end of the 20th century are applied to have a community room, which frequently is used to store bikes. However, in other buildings, there is not this kind of spaces and some of them don't even have a elevator where you can pick up your bike to your flat. The first approach to cover bicycle parking facilities was an initiative that took place in the year 2011, when two premises owned by the municipality were adapted for bicycle parking. At the same time, an open call was opened to the neighborhood in which interested uh, bicycle owners should constitute a management community to be in charge of the facility. All costs like uh, light, water, cleaning, etc. are paid by the users. In 2013, the Municipal Plenary approved a citizen's initiative to create this type of spaces. And as a result, a study was carried out in 2014 to characterize the demand. Its aim was to determine the volume of demand, identify the characteristic of the people willing to use the service, and to specify the prices, conditions, location, and branch of services in which they will do so. This study revealed results such as the fact that two-thirds of uh, regular bike users would be willing to use the network of a secure bike parking. Another driver to the implementation was the selection of the project within the city's participatory budget program. In this program, citizens or associations make their proposals and after being evaluated and pre-selected by the technical staff of the, of the municipality are exposed to the public and the previous 
proposals are selected by popular groups. Uh, it should also be mentioned that we have received external funding, for example, from the Basque Energy Agency and from European projects such as uh, City Change Carbonite and um, Park Forza. The Council has also worked to support bicycle parking through regulations. In 2018, a new ordinance was approved. It establishes the requirements to create new bicycle or street parking. Previously, the regulation for car parking was applied also to bicycle parking, making them very difficult and expensive to implement. In 2019, the revision of the sound was presented. This document contains an action that establishes a program for the consolidation and extension of the parking network and assigns an estimated budget of 500,000 euros to be spent over 10 years. There is currently a draft of an ordinance that will regulate conditions of access and use of the network. This will be great help to enforce the correct use of the service. The locations of the sites are part of, that are part of the network have been selected trying to respond to situations with a high demand for parking. Accordingly, three of these facilities are located uh, in the city and commercial area of the city. Besides, in, the case, uh, in this case, they also provide service to many users whose buildings to Toro have lift. Both the bus station and the train station have a facility in the proximity. The rest of the bicycle parking serve a large sport facility and several residential areas of the city. All the premises are easily accessible from the city's central network. At this moment, the network consists of nine parking sites with a total of 526 spaces for bikes. All the network facilities located in public space are covered and accessible modules with an automatic door with security systems, smart access control and video recording. They provide capacity for 50 bikes and one of them is specifically for cargo bikes. They are easily removable in order to be able to transfer them to other locations in the future if needed. To use the service is necessary to register through a website or a mobile app. And depending on how much these facilities are used, they have different rates. Users can park their bikes in any of the parking facilities of the network. The registration of users in the system is constant. There are over 2,700 at this moment. The same applies to the number of monthly unique users, equal from an average of 175 in 2019 to 350 in 2020. And that's even taking into account that the effect of the pandemic and that from mid-March to mid-May, we will suffer a severe lockdown. For Victoria State City Council, the next steps are... We want to keep working on the extension of the network. In the image, you can see the design of the new facility to be added. In this case, and as a novelty, it is a space of the ground floor of a residential building that is going to be adapted for a bicycle parking. We are also expecting to receive shortly a study that we have hired to explore the possibility to expand the network incorporating facilities of private owners and to award the contract for the management of the network to a social company. From our experience, we can say to those cities that are thinking of creating something similar that in the first place is very convenient to evaluate and characterize the demand listen to the potential users and take into account their needs and expectations. In addition, a gradual deployment will allow you to test the use of the different locations and you won't need to have a large budget to start with. It is also fundamental to ensure political support and in case the funding is an issue, do not forget that it can be obtained from other resources besides the municipal budget. 
and to end, I will encourage to promote the service using all, all available tools like social media, risk actions, etc. And this is everything from my side. So, if there are any questions or comments? Thank you very much, and thank you for keeping the time. I think it's it's really uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, to see how again you stress the importance to listen to the user needs uh, when you when you plan the location of these uh, parking infrastructures. Um, but uh, I hand over to Meredith uh, for a follow up question. Great, thank thank you, Isabel. Um, so yeah, one question that uh, that we thought of was, well, we know from research that cycling infrastructure is a more efficient use of public resources than car infrastructure. So how do you foresee this solution being scaled up, uh, especially with uh, an eye on equitable uh, and, 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 you know, equity and um, low income folks who um, who also need to pay close attention to budgets so you know across all income groups and then how can it also maintain that customer base for the long term thinking about these equity issues mm -hmm. um, a good solution might be to use push and pull strategies so not not only cycling uh, mobility is promoted uh, by improving or creating new infrastructure uh, but also penalizing the use of other less sustainable uh, means, uh, for instance, by acting on parking uh, for motor vehicles, um, reducing the number of parking spaces, expanding the regulated areas, or increasing the rates. Great, thank you. Okay, Marco, a question directly to Isabel from the audience. Yes, a flash question is on the importance that you give to cargo to cargo buys in your city. And also a small remark, uh, uh, there is one person, Marty Hoy, saying that uh, these igloos look very large. So how do you install them in residential areas? Mm, we install them in like a uh, public space that it has not a determined use. And uh, they are nine meter longs um, per 5.5 uh, meters wide. They might look big, but they are not that big. Oh, I forgot about the cargo bikes. Yeah, what about cargo bikes? In a project, the city changer cargo bike that I mentioned before. And one of the actions we had to take was to improve infrastructure for cargo bikes and our way to do so was to adapt one of the spaces of the facilities for cargo bike parking. Yes, because these are very expensive assets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. Oh, okay. Well, I also miss safe parking uh, in Brussels. Uh, I'm always looking for uh, a traffic uh, sign where I can tie my bike uh, to. Then I see, oh, there's already two other bikes uh, that had the same idea. And uh, so, I mean, it does not necessarily be your complex igloos where the people have to pay to use them. But uh, uh, the first example that you showed, uh, these iron bars uh, are quite simple to install and they already uh, serve uh, the purpose. So. Uh, mm -hmm. But the the igloos is this a, a private uh, company business case or is it the city driving the igloos? The city owns the igloos, but then we hire a company to manage the system, like for all the technology, um, like uh, the app, the website, uh, the access control, and they also do the cleaning of the facilities. Okay, good. Um, I think uh, let's open the discussion to all the speakers. Uh, please come all uh, online and show your faces. Uh, and uh, we want to uh, take a little bit the questions that have been uh, arriving here from the audience. And uh, I'd like to start with a question that has already been uh, submitted uh, to us uh, in the previous webinar and we promised uh, to take it uh, today. So the question goes uh, to Rose because it refers to policymakers, Rose. 
How do you convince policymakers to make cycle facilities safe for all types of cyclists, including the occasional one or the, the elderly or disabled? The question is from Howie Martin. Um, yeah, I, I, I think based on where Ireland is at the moment, I think policymakers are listening. Um, you, you'll see that the budget for Ireland, approximately 175 million per annum, has been allocated specifically for cycling going forward, which is a huge commitment on behalf of policymakers. But outside of the specifics, I do know like there are where the, the Green Schools Travel Programme, which is funded through Ontasca, and they do cycle training for young, young people. But in addition to that, what they are doing now is they're inviting in the parents who are occasional cyclists and they're giving them safe training so that they'll be more confident in taking their children to school to cycle and, and to cycle um, uh, recreationally. Um, because a lot of our parents out there are not used to cycling anymore or cycled as children. It's been years since they've been on a bike and they need to build that confidence and get that training to be comfortable to encourage it. So I think we have a, a long way to go um, I think we are improving as we go and I think we have, in Ireland in particular, have a substantial budget set aside to address those issues. And I think every European country, you know, we need to look at uh, all age groups and all uh, capabilities to, to look at what we can do to uh, enhance that more for disabled cyclists or cyclists with mobility issues and also elderly cyclists. Um, I do know my dad likes to cycle and has always cycled and uh, he's in his late 70 now and he still cycles uh, uh, and, uh, and enjoys it at his leisurely pace. But he'd be the first to say, you know, some of our cycle routes are not, are not safe. You know, it, he does feel under pressure. The cycle cyclists are too close to traffic. And these are all things that um, each of these, the assemblies in Ireland as part of our regional spatial and economic strategy are looking to address and will, you know, be looking to address going forward um, when we're looking at all of the local authority development plans and transport plans to ensure that those areas are addressed. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, we, we saw some of the design principles that Meredith uh, outlined and uh, the paths which are nicely separated uh, from the street. Of course, that gives a lot of confidence uh, for such, but um, it's a question of space availability uh, as well. Um, Marco, I think uh, let's address the questions uh, that relate to uh, uh, public transport uh, versus biking. Yes, uh, it was a question coming from uh, Martin Kears and it was uh, initially directed to Meredith because he spotted like a uh, detail of your presentation when you um, say that uh, uh, an increase of cycling may result as well in a decrease in public transportation use. So how do you comment that? Do you mean the question of how what the synergy is or uh, well both the synergy and the consequences of more cycling on uh, the use of public transportation that was the, the the message of the question okay yeah um well in the dutch context the 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 bicycle acts as sort of a feeder to the larger system of the train network and in, in the context too of public transport here, there are a variety of different types of urban regional transportation, public transportation networks. So what my presentation was talking about was this, the larger inter-regional um, tra train system that links you know, the, the main urban um, areas, uh, but also the smaller rural areas as well. Um, so the bicycle in the urban areas acts as this feeder to, um, uh, to the train system, which then you can connect to any destination uh, in Europe, basically, but also you know, within the Netherlands. Um, and so in the, ne in the Netherlands, about 50% of all train passengers arrive at the station by bicycle. Uh, so this presents a situation where, well, one, the bicycle could not be taken on board. Right. Like that would be that's not a scalable option. Um, 
so in this case, the the National Railways, you know, partnered with the uh, local stations to offer a last mile um, resource a bicycle at the destination station. So there is now um, fleets of bicycles. Uh, I think literally at every single train station in the Netherlands um, at a variety of different scales. But this offers this maximum flexibility for uh, for for train riders. Uh, to then end their journey and um, with one, the same public transit card that can get you all over the, the, the country also can get you a, uh, a public transit bicycle called the Ove Feats um, and you, you, it's a one day sort of rental. So you, uh, you, um, you, know, you have your card and you rent it for the day and then you return it to that same station. It's very different than a dockless bike sharing system or even other um, docked bike sharing systems. It's specifically uh, addressing this bike train system. So um, there's so much to talk about with the bike train uh, network, but um, we also have a variety of uh, academic papers on this topic on our website that uh, more fully discusses this, um, this synergy, but, but it really is a very special system. And, um, and one, actually my colleague just produced a, a new um, paper out that talked about that uh, people who use this bike train system are actually, they actually prefer it and it does replace car trips. So the bicycle alone, you know, can't really replace most car trips when you're talking about distance. But if you add in the, the train system, it opens up a whole new world for people who are um, uh, wanting to switch from a car to, uh, to a bicycle and public transit system. Other speakers who want to comment on that? No, I, I think, uh, Rose here, I think it's um, really interesting that you're, because I know with the Lewis Cycle and Ride, they put in bike, bike um, hire stations at, at the stops, at three of the stops, but they're not specifically dedicated to the Lewis Light Rail. Somebody could take a bike from there and drop it at another station somewhere in the city and not necessarily bring it back. So it's, I think it's quite interesting to look at that specific link and providing a specific service just purely for that commuter to get to their destination. It's really interesting. I think uh, uh, Meredith uh, uh, very nicely made the point uh, that uh, uh, the bike uh, uh, and uh, the rail is a system that uh, is having a very strong uh, synergy and complementarity as opposed to uh, what maybe came from our question, like uh, would increasing cycling reduce uh, the use of public transport? Maybe urban buses, yes. And maybe the current pandemic uh, uh, drop in public transport is suggesting this, but I think uh, this is a, a, a not, not normal times. I think the normal would be much more the synergy where the bikes are the feeders for the last and the first mile uh, uh, to a, a, a rail based uh, uh, transport. Uh, and uh, I think uh, also, Meredith, you, you, you mentioned that it is not scalable, this idea to take the bike uh, on board of the train. This is possible if it is a minority, but if it's, uh, if it's reaching a certain, especially during peak hours where public transport is already uh, uh, full to cracking, uh, it's not possible. And I think, don't think it should be, it, it could be uh, incentivized in beginner cities, I think, where the share is very low. Uh, and um, I have many examples here in uh, Germany where uh, travel with a bike during peak hours uh, is costing, whereas it is free in off-peak times and uh, in some, uh, on some routes it is uh, prohibited uh, during uh, peak hours. But um, it's, it becomes impossible as more people do it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and well, that's one reason why the, the local municipalities here are investing heavily into these large bicycle parking garages uh, at the train stations or near the train stations. 
you know, 20,000 bikes, bicycle parking places, um, very top, you know, innovative designs. Um, but because the idea is that, you know, yeah, you, you simply cannot take your bicycle on the train when during peak hours. In fact, they do disincentivize it. it it's not allowed during during commute peak hours and um, any other time it costs nearly seven euros, which is also a major disincentive to uh, to not take your bike on the train. However, the bicycle parking facilities are free for the first day. So, um, you know, you can park your bicycle in the in the facilities, um, go to work, do your business, and then uh, come back and, and get your bicycle again. Okay, Marco, more questions? Yes, I have another one very interesting from Alessia Porcellini. She's uh, referring to the fact that in Italy during lockdown, we had uh, incentives to buy bicycles. So she's curious to know whether the examples that you show on the infrastructure development are also accompanied to a, a certain extent by a regulatory or policy framework that incentivizes the use of bicycles. Um, I know here in Ireland, we do have an incentive scheme. So we have a, a bike to work scheme, which offers people um, an allowance to purchase a bicycle and that then gets set off against their taxes going forward. So they get about 50% of the cost of the bike is covered. Um, and it's an incentive for people to make the initial investment to purchase the a bike to, to tra travel. So there is a linkage of some sort of financial support for them. Okay, uh, a final question from the audience and then a final round of statements from our speakers, Marco. Yes, of course. Another one uh, is uh, basically what is the reaction of drivers in your city vis-a-vis -vis the increase of uh, cyclists around them? That's one for Indrek. What are the drivers thinking? <laughs> Please repeat again. Hello. But how are the drivers, the car drivers reacting if you promote them? It's very hard to say Somebody because... Uh, having their mic uh, on while you don't speak, please switch it off. We can't hear very well. Okay. Then, Do you listen to me now? No? Hello? Yes, I hear you, but okay. Maybe the voice is very clear. Okay. Do, do you listen, listen to me? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Maybe somebody I'm else wants to take the question. Um, so can you repeat the question? I also didn't didn't get it. Yes, it was. Uh, what is the reaction of uh, drivers uh, in your city when they see uh, an enormous increase in the numbers of cyclists? I don't think we've had major reactions from uh, motorists in relation to the numbers of cyclists. I think we have um, a lot of reaction from motorists when we try and pedestrianize an area or a street and that's when you get a whole lot of pushback um, in that a lot of the uh, businesses um, uh, who are also motorists in the areas um, are not necessarily um, in favour of it. Um, but I do think, you know, what we've tended to do is that we've tended to pedestrianise streets in segments. So we don't do a huge street, we do one section of a street. And then that grows to another section of a street till eventually the whole street is pedestrianized. Um, but at the end of the day, I do think in most cases when that happens, that the actual owners of business along the way feel that because the whole public realm has been improved and there's a lot more uh, football, footfall outside of their businesses, their businesses have not been um, impacted negatively. So it kind of, it has to happen for them to see that. So they're not necessarily hugely favorable at the outset. Yes, and sometimes some business uh, suffer, but others uh, uh, emerge um, 
Yeah. Okay. Well, looking at the time, I would uh, invite now uh, each speaker to make a, a last uh, uh, statement. What is for you the most important point or the lesson that you take away from today's webinar? And uh, uh, why not start with Meredith and then we go in the order of the speakers. So. Yeah, it's hard to wrap it all up in one sentence uh, or one statement, but um, but I would say the examples that we saw today, in my mind, continue to convince me that in order to scale up, you know, the use of bicycles in cities, that the the skill sets um, of planners um, are evolving, um, and of course, it depends on who you're talking to, the engineer, the planner, the uh, even politicians. But what seems to be really crucial are the very context dependent skills, the relationship building, you know, negotiating political and regulatory maneuvering that's necessary to be quite bold and bold enough to put bicycle infrastructure on the agenda, but also to keep it on the agenda through multiple election cycles next for the next, you know, decades to come. Okay, Indrek, what is uh, your lesson that you take away from today's webinar? Yeah, since, uh, I think that uh, most important to, for, for me, is, uh, uh, we are not last one. We, we our development strategy is quite uh, right. And uh, of course, uh, we have same design problems like everywhere. Every day, conflict uh, between uh, between cars, between pedestrians, between cyclists, and uh, solution must be very flexible. It's uh, uh, we can't use the, uh, all over the one uh, uh, strategy because people and nationalities is diff different. I mean that no people is a little bit uh, different uh, as uh, Bilbao people, for example. It means that, uh, but anyway, it was a good to listen. Thank you, Indre. Rose, what are you taking away? Um, I suppose one of the big things that I would have taken away today from a number of the presentations, including my own one, um, it, it is it's all fine for policymakers and um, government departments to make decisions about uh, bike infrastructure and cycle and rail infrastructure. But I think it's really, really critical that they engage with the public and engage with the passengers to really identify what is actually need, because that's where you will get the best value for that infrastructure investment. If you actually deliver on the needs of the passengers um, to meet those, you're probably going to have much more success rather than just making decisions in a, a government or a transport department without actually interacting with the people that will actually be using that infrastructure. So that's my takeaway from today. Yeah, one of mine as well. How about you, Isabel? I completely agree with Rose. Uh, I would highlight from these presentations the importance of developing cycling infrastructure in an integrated, integrated way, but not only in its uh, physical components, but also taking into account the contributions of the experts, the users, and the decision makers. Wow. Yes, very useful uh, a round of uh, statements uh, which close up nicely and you summarize better than I could have. Uh, so you see, you've done my job in summarizing what are the takeaways. Uh, and uh, this is why I would like to thank you dearly for your preparation, for your presentation, for your time and uh, for your flexibility in taking uh, the questions. Thank you to the audience uh, for staying with us uh, in good numbers uh, until the end. And uh, let me announce uh, again next Thursday, we are focusing on behavior change measures, awareness raising, but real also training and behavior switch uh, uh, incentives and disincentives. So uh, 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 check with us. 
and uh, my colleague Elena Ferrario is going to say a few closing words now. So all speakers may switch off their webcam. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Katerina, and thank you, all the speakers. Let me uh, say just one last word about, as I promised at the beginning, um, one of the services of the policy learning platform. It is uh, for us um, a, a good thing always uh, taking these opportunities to uh, highlight one of these uh, services, in particular today, the peer review. This is really the golden service of the policy learning platform. and. Um, and that we encourage you to test it. So if you are if you are thinking of uh, making a revision to your mobility policy or you're thinking simply to simply to introduce new measures to make some changes there and you're looking for inspiration, you're looking to find ideas somewhere else. Well, you can reach out for the policy learning platform and we are there to help you. Our experts do it from A to Z. Uh, we elaborate together with you a set of policy recommendations that are really concrete, really hands-on and very much tailored to your needs. Um, upon receipt of this uh, um, of the peer review request from you, uh, we organize uh, everything. We select a number of peers, meaning practitioners of regional development policies that share your challenges and have already perhaps solutions to give you and uh, we organize a meeting that lasts two days it's on site or online and during these two days all together we look at your territorial context we look at your challenge and uh, well uh, all together we elaborate this uh, set of, of really concrete advice that you can start implementing basically from day one after the peer review up until well uh, implementing maybe measures that can be done on a medium or, or long term term uh, period. So please do not hesitate to reach out for me or for Katarina or any other experts of the policy learning platform. We are there to um, help you uh, understanding whether it is uh, a good way maybe for you to, uh, to try this, uh, this service. And um, well, maybe a lot will uh, now indicate in the chat uh, the link to an interview um, of one of the one of the beneficiaries of the peer reviews that is uh, really enthusiastic about this service, and it's always good to have also the words from those who really benefited from it. So uh, click there and uh, and explore um, how to how this uh, this service works. Well, uh, now it's also my time to say goodbye to everybody. Thanks again to the speakers and to the uh, participants. And well, see you next week. Ciao, bye. See you next week. Have a good afternoon. Thank you, Elena. Bye bye. Ciao, bye. <laughs>